Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Big Ideas on the Go. I'm excited to have as our guest today, Amkar Arastaratnam, uh, who is Engineering Director at Cloud Security at Google. Um, we've asked Amkar to join us today to talk a little bit about his experience in security, compliance, in financial services. Obviously, with uh, many of the things going on right now in terms of supply chain security, in terms of um, new privacy regulations like CIPRA, possibility of new privacy regulations in the federal government uh, with the new uh, Congress uh, after January 20th. So I think we have lots and lots uh, to talk about. So maybe just to get uh, started, um, Amkar, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background um, you know, to date in terms of your work in financial services and, and how you got to kind of where you are today. Absolutely. Thanks, Dimitri, for inviting me, and it's a real pleasure to be on the on the podcast. Um, I've I've had a long history in security and privacy. Of course, um, the views that I'll express today are my own, not that of Google. But um, I actually began my career at IBM and um, was doing software development and outsourcing and tech support and all kinds of things there. And then really got bitten by the security bug um, in late. 2004, if memory serves correct. So that was about 17 years ago. Um, and I started off as a penetration tester, as we called them back then, or the cool kids, I guess, call it red teaming now. Um, and then various roles in security, uh, architecture, governance, risk compliance, so on and so forth, helping IBM customers with their security journey. Um, and then eventually I went to TD Bank in Toronto, where I was the chief security architect. Um, I went from there to Deutsche Bank in New York, where I was the CTO of the security office. Um, I moved on to Credit Suisse, where I was the head of engineering and product management for cybersecurity. Um, my last role in financial sector was JP Morgan, where I ran data protection engineering uh, for the bank. And now I'm back into technology. I, I call my career the tech sandwich. Um, so I'm back to tech. And as you stated, I'm a director of engineering at Google. And my accountabilities are for building the software controls that we use so that our regulated customers can use GCP. That's terrific. Um, so it sounds like you have a long story uh, background. And given just your tenure in financial services, I am curious about the evolution from regulations like Sarbanes-Oxley uh, to uh, Graham Leachy. You know, maybe you could talk a little bit about you know how that impacted financial services and how that's evolved over time. Absolutely. Um, I think initially, and if we look to GLBA or SOX, um, a lot of it was around the integrity of the integrity of controls when it comes to things like financial reporting and things of that nature, especially with SOX. And because of that, a lot of the accountability rolled up to the uh, CFO. One of the things that we've seen progress a lot in financial sector is twofold. And um, you'll recognize from my experience, I had the opportunity to work at a couple of European banks as well. Um, the European banks and Credit Suisse, of course, being in Switzerland, technically outside of the EU, but still with some pretty um, opinionated views with regards to privacy. Um, they, they took a bit of a different turn um, towards the end of the 2010s and focused a lot more on privacy, privacy of the employee, privacy of the uh, customer. And in addition to these kind of regulatory compliance requirements as they pertain to things like, you know, how are you producing your general ledger and your reports and things of that nature, financial sector started to care a lot more about how the PII of their customers and employees were handled. Um, for example, when working at Deutsche, there was a lot of attention paid, even from an internal threat reporting perspective, as to how we protected employee sensitive information so as not to come off as using that data inappropriately, even if it was in the prog process of investigating potential security incidents. Now, domestically, uh, to your point, we're all waiting to see how the new administration may consider 
a federal level of uh, privacy protection. We're already seeing a lot of changes being made with regards to CCPA in California. And it's really changing the view of financial sector in terms of how that PII is handled. We almost took it as a, um, we almost took it as a default that certain kinds of information uh, with regards to frequent buyer status, things of that could be used within financial sector to improve marketing, to improve targeting, things of that nature. And due to regulation like GDPR, like CCPA, the attitude on that's changing a lot. So I am curious, right? So when you when you got started, it was there were other kind of banking specific uh, regulations, and you worked for a Swiss bank that obviously has very very strict, um, you know, private banking and, and wealth management uh, regulations. You know, with 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 CCPA and now CIPRA and now other kind of global um, privacy regulations, how do you see this um, evolving in terms of that interplay between what you've done around data protection? Um, you know, whether it's masking data, tokenizing data restricting access to data, and some of the requirements around privacy, more around do not follow, do not sell, um, you know, do not transfer. You know, wh where do you see that intersection? So I think that more and more, we're gonna to have to rely on technology to do it, right? It's not going to be a person or a fleet of people kind of making these decisions. And our ability to route PII and make runtime or at least programmatic decisions about when, where, and how that's shared based on what our customers tell us is going to become really important. The reality is that what we're seeing more and more coming from privacy legislation is that people's choice, the, the autonomy that people want in having the say in what occurs with their PII is really what embodies a lot of the privacy legislation that we're seeing today. I remember hearing from uh, Dr. Ann Kavukian, who used to be the privacy minister in Ontario a few years ago, and she expressed the difference between privacy and confidentiality as privacy being used the individual having the autonomy to provide informed consent as to what you wanted done with your PII, whereas confidentiality ended up being the protections or controls that we put in place should you not wish to disclose that. So if I was to willfully disclose to you and the listeners of this podcast that I had asthma, uh, that would be my choice. However, we wouldn't want that choice being made on your behalf. I think the other interesting artifact of this is there's a lot of businesses that have been built around the idea that we can perform better ad targeting, we can, we can provide consumers more tailored content based on what we've been able to infer about their preferences through processing PII. I think that is going to, um, that's going to get more and more interesting as time goes on. I think we've seen some of that with some of the changes that Apple has made to their app store recently in terms of putting more of a spotlight on how different apps are interacting with your personally identifiable information. And I think as there's more and more informed consent people's patterns might change slightly, which from a financial sector perspective also means some of the areas that were previously being monetized in terms of buying behavior um, might start to change along with that. And I think just like with every major change that we've seen, um, it, it gets back to Darwin's theory, right? Those that evolve quicker and those that adapt to this new change in impetus and perhaps those that even find other ways of differentiating their brand through improved privacy, um, through giving the customer more autonomy, are going to be the ones that end up being leaders in the market. So kind of a corollary question at part B to this. Um, so you've obviously seen more recently that kind of shift to the cloud, right? I think mm -hmm. banks were hesitant about moving to the cloud, partly because I think they felt more secure about their data, knowing that it was housed in New Jersey in some data center. Now that organizations are moving to the cloud and data has essentially become the new perimeter, if you will, how does that um, uh, impact how financial services organizations think about both privacy and protection of their information? 
I think a lot of uh, financial sector companies are actually viewing it as an opportunity. And the opportunity is, as with any major uh, change that occurs, it's very easy to jump on a parallel change agent. So if I want to refactor my application, a great opportunity to do that is through a move to the cloud. And if I want to refactor my application in such a way that it allows better privacy controls, um, that's a path that a lot of financial sector companies are taking. It's also causing them to have to be a lot more introspective. And I think especially to my days working in the New York branch of a European bank and the kind of data that would egress from Europe and go into America um, for the purposes of storage or internal processing, it starts to become an opportunity to rethink how much of that data is actually needed to be processed, to your point, in a data center in New Jersey, uh, versus what of that data, depending on the provider chosen, needs to stay resident within Europe, can egress to other regions, what of that data needs to be masked if a provider's administrator should need access to it? All these kind of equations. And I think this gets back also to being able to catalog what you actually have. To your point, when everything was within the four walls of your own data center, um, it was much easier to point your finger at where the data was held. And, As and Go on, Dimitri. Yeah, no, I was just kind of curious. You mentioned the word catalog. So do you think it's a it's a problem of cataloging or more of a problem of inventorying your data assets? So is it a pure metadata issue or is it broadly a data asset issue? I think it's a bit of both um, in the sense that being able to have an authoritative catalog as to where all of Omkar's stuff lives, if Omkar is a EU citizen and if my data is subject to GDPR protection, or even in the case of CCPA. And if you think of the way mega banks are set up, I could have multiple different relationships with the bank, um, whether it be retail, whether it be a mortgage, car loan, wealth management, what have you. And being able to provide pointers back to all the places that my stuff lives, um, should I decide to either ask the bank to forget it or if there's an improvement that needs to be made or to restrict sharing. Um, that's something that a lot of the larger banks are starting to come to as a necessity now and something that they kind of bifurcated across business lines before with little thought. Look, I, I, think, uh, look, I think that's a very salient point. And uh, I'm glad to hear that the financials are kind of moving in that direction. And I think it probably, I'm sure COVID and the experience under COVID in terms of the shift to the cloud uh, probably just is uh, bringing that home a little bit. Um, you know, I, I am kind of curious about your thoughts kind of what the future looks like, right? So um, CIPRA just got passed in the in the last election. I think there's still kind of a two year, um, two year timeline before it uh, takes effect, but there are other regulations coming into effect. Uh, there's other retention management regulations. Um, you know, where do you think things go from here? How do you think uh, banks, financials, but even more broadly, other um, organizations need to shift their thinking to accommodate some of these emerging regulations? So the way that we approached it um, in previous organizations was rather than trying to tactically comply with each and every mandate of each and every individual regulation and each and every jurisdiction that we operated, we would take a risk control and compliance view. And if you think of these almost like three separate columns in a spreadsheet, you have your set of risks, you know, the bad stuff that could go wrong. You have your set of controls, which are helping you to reduce the inherent risk of those risks in the risk column down to within your risk tolerance. And then you map those controls back to compliance requirements. So there are very few compliance requirements that are intentionally in conflict. And there are some edge cases like, I'll give you an example, uh, US NIST 
crypto standards versus Russian versus Chinese. Um, and also when it comes to things like data residency. So uh, what GDPR says about residents versus say a, another uh, nationally aligned legislation may be in, in conflict due to the fact that they're considering different parts of the world. Um, I think how things are going to evolve is people are going to look at these uh, control capabilities uh, much more generically and then map them back to the compliance regimes that they're trying to comply with rather than try and play whack-a-mole with compliance. I think the other thing that we're going to see is there's, there's this great pendulum swing that's gone to almost completely regionalized data residents. I don't think that's going to be homeostasis. And the reason I believe that is, you know, there are the kind of capabilities that you get from being able to leverage global footprints of various providers. Uh, there is a benefit to that. There's a commercial benefit in terms of efficiency. There's a technology benefit in terms of adoption and research and development. And I think we're going to reach homeostasis somewhere between the, you know, say the world of the late 90s, early 2000s, where it was a bit of wild, wild west when it came to PII uh, versus where the pendulum swung now, where we're getting into some rather strict residency requirements where the world just can't sustain having, you know, some of these technical capabilities in jurisdictions that are that small. So I, I think in the future, there'll be some normalization there as it pertains to residency. Okay, uh, that's great. Uh, look, I think this has been terrific. I wanna kind of maybe uh, end it on a little bit of a lighter note. I think earlier um, you had mentioned that um, uh, either on their own or maybe through a little bit of encouragement from you, uh, your your kids could actually read privacy statements and are privacy literate. Could you maybe talk a little bit about why you think that's important and what do you think it means um, to raising, you know, full fully enrolled digital citizens? Absolutely. So uh, for <laughs> for for the listeners of this podcast, uh, my kids are nine and eleven, so they're way more technically advanced than I am. And to your point, they are digital native. Um, I recall a time when my daughter was about three and upstairs in our house, we have this old uh, CRT based TV, one of the last CRT based TVs slash first HD TVs. And she was about three years old and she got very upset because she wanted to change channels on the TV and she couldn't swipe the screen. Um, and that's just how kids process nowadays. So I think firstly, the earlier that we teach them about security and privacy and you know the nature of how to interact on the internet, the better it's gonna be for them. And the same way that we teach them to look both ways before they cross the street, we should, we should teach them to inquire as to the privacy policies of the apps they use. So we have a strict policy at home. My, you know, we're blessed that we're quite fortunate in terms of the fact that we have more computers in the house than people. But before my kids install a new app or before they install, um, or before they start using a new website with their friends, the normal routine is they need to pre-process the privacy policy. They need to tell me whether there's a COPA clause, whether there's a GDPR clause, whether there's any kind of clauses for ages, age ranges that they're out of, whether there's any consideration for minors, and they will actually, they will actually pre-read the privacy policy for me. And they've gotten so good that they actually leave me notes as to whether they believe that the privacy policy is good or not. And what we ended up doing with COVID and with all the learning going online is they have an agreement with their teachers now that we have a shared Google sheet if the teacher wants to incorporate some online app or website that they haven't heard before, um, it goes in the sheet. We jointly review it as a family. And then the uh, teacher is free to use that app with my kids. So uh, yeah, I think it's it's really important for us to consider this just a, a basic part of the way the kids consume data off the internet. Look, I think that's really inspiring. Uh, I think I probably have a little bit of work to do with with my my two kids, uh, but um, hopefully this will be kind of a motivation for all of us. 
to make all of our um, uh, progeny a little bit more uh, digital, digitally native. Um, uh, Ankar, you know, maybe with that, uh, we'll kind of wrap up. I did want to say thank you. I think this has been hugely uh, informative to both myself and the audience. Um, uh, I really appreciate you sharing kind of your experience in financial services uh, and some of the shifts underway, both in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, the move to the cloud. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, I do appreciate you, you coming on and joining us. Uh, I'd also like to remind everybody to subscribe to uh, Big Ideas on the Go, uh, our podcast, and I'd like to encourage everybody to please leave reviews. Um, and I look forward to seeing and hearing from everybody uh, on the next episode. And Amkar, thank you again for joining us today. Thanks, Dimitri. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.